Welcome. Good to see everyone here today. So, my God is all that I need. He's my strength. When I can't go on, you feel like sometimes you can't go on. Well, God is our strength. When we need his peace, uh, when all our strength is gone, he's there to give us peace. And the country of Israel, God fights for them. The country of Israel uh, was attacked yesterday, surprise attack. Fifty years after the battle of Yom Kippur in 1973, the war of Yom Kippur, they surprised attack Israel. Um, so far, they say over 600 Jewish people are dead. Uh, thousands have been injured. Uh, they overwhelm their borders with uh, Islam fighters. It's all Islam doing this. And uh, they kidnapped scores of people. They don't know how many soldiers as well as uh, women, men. They've, they've gone door to door into houses, breaking down the doors and got in and shot people, killed them. Uh, there's videos of it. And it's very dramatic. It's very sad to see the world's hatred, Satan channeling his hatred and anger for Israel through people and getting them to go after Israel and kill them. That is what is happening. Uh, it's tragic to see this. And they think they're going to annihilate Israel and move them, drive them into the sea and uh, take their land away from them. Well, God said, once I plant my people back in their land, and that happened in 1948, it says they will never, ever be uprooted again. It will not happen. And so this particular war that's happening right now, they will not be uprooted. They will not be successful. They will lose. Israel will win. Since they've been a nation, one minute after midnight when they became a nation, they were attacked from all sides, from Egypt and, and then from the east and from the, the north. And they, and they won. Every single battle they've been in, they won. They even had a war that lasted six days. <laughs> and they won that war. And they will win this war. But it's a tragedy to see uh, innocent men and women and children all just slaughtered because Satan has put it in their heart to do this. So uh, the psalm that I had chosen last week before all, all of this even happened, I think is very appropriate because it's a psalm of David. Remember David, King David? When the, the people would chant about King Saul and saying, hey, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. David is the one and his mighty men uh, th that went out and, and gave Israel the biggest land purchase that they've had, uh, gave them peace, uh, and then through his son Solomon. So he was a mighty warrior. He wanted to build a temple for God, but God said, no, David, your hands are too bloody. You're a man of war, so I'm going to use your son Solomon to do that. But David trusted in God. He was not afraid of people. He, he began this, this whole life of trusting in God uh, as a young boy. And when he was the shepherd of the family sheep, when a lion would come and take one of those sheep, he would go after the lion and take the sheep back. <laughs> and then the lion would come after him because he just took his dinner. And he said, when the lion came after me, God enabled me to kill it. And he said, a bear did the same thing, and God enabled me to kill the bear. And when he saw this giant Goliath, this giant Philistine, God said, what are you guys afraid of? And they're like, <laughs> look at them. <laughs> you know, or maybe like, look at him because he was nine feet tall, nine foot something. David said, I'm not afraid of him because the same God that enabled me to protect my sheep is going to now allow me to protect Israel. And, and when he went out to face the lion, giant, the, the giant said, would you come with me with sticks and stones? You, you send a little boy? 
And David said, I don't come to you with a sword and a spear. I come to you in the name of the Lord God. And today the birds are going to be eating you. And, and the giant just laughed at him and, and was mad at him that how dare you. And, and giant, the giant died. The giant fell dead because of God enabling David to do it. So David is talking about his God, how his God protects him. And it wasn't David, it was his God, he said, that protected him. And in every verse in this scripture, you get the, the focus of David, who was, who was called a man after God's own heart. All of his attention was focused on God. It was God that did everything for him, that fought for him, that enabled him. And he said, I don't have any fear because, because God is my strength. So follow along as we read Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in the shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. For you have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O oh, you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O oh God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O oh Lord. Lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries. For false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Let's pray to the Lord. Father in heaven, we thank you for how you have made people and how you have given us uh, this ability to communicate with you, to be taken care of by you. Thank you that we have your protection. Thank you, Lord, that you have made us in your image after your likeness, that we have a spirit that can know your spirit. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to pay for our sin, to cover it all so that we can have our relationship with you. Thank you that you come and live inside of us so we can communicate with you and have your strength and your power right here in us when we need it. We just praise you, Lord, for this life of David, uh, the example of a man who did great things for you and he claims to do have, have done it all by the power and by your doing and your power and, and your working through his life to protect him. So we do seek your face. We want to know you more. We want to fellowship with you. Uh, as we worship you today, we pray that our hearts will be lifted up to you in song and praise and worship. Thank you for these songs that we're going to sing and for all the great words in them. And for the people of Jerusalem, the people of Israel right now, Lord, we pray for your divine protection 
for your power to overwhelm the enemy with whatever you will bring against them. Save your people Israel in this land that is yours, that you have given to them. Save it for you and them only. And we do pray for the peace of Israel. We pray that there will be a true and lasting peace and thank you that it will happen when you do return to this earth and the Mount of Olives to bring that about. So Father, our eyes are upon you, upon your word. Teach us from your truth uh, to be able to look at these events in Israel and know how to interpret them properly according to what you say. And bless these people, Lord, with the help that they need. And uh, we pray that their enemies will receive your divine justice upon them and that the whole world will know that you are God and that Israel is your people and that the whole world will know, including the Jewish people, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the, the Savior of our soul. So we commit ourselves to you, the service to you. We pray that you will be glorified and we pray that your spirit will be uh, alive and well in our hearts, teaching us and guiding us. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus, your son, and ask that your perfect will be done. Amen. Prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, the fact that you're always with us. We thank you that you're in us. And we pray that as we open your word and as we see what you have to say, that your spirit will be the one that enlightens our hearts, that illumines us and leads us into all truth. Thank you for the word of truth. Thank you that we can rely 100% on everything that you declare to us in your word. So bless our time together. We just give you all the praise and all the glory for you are the great almighty God, the creator of heavens and earth and our faith and our trust and our hope is in you. In Jesus name we pray, amen. So uh, this morning we're in the book of Romans uh, chapter five and we're in verse two of chapter five and we've been there for a few weeks now because there are so many issues and, and uh, things we need to talk about, things that are so crucial, things that are so wonderful. In the whole book of Romans, every book of the Bible is so wonderful. Uh, rich treasures to be mined, rich treasures to be explored. So in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, in our context of what we're studying, uh, today we're going to be just be looking at that last phrase in verse 2. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. What all does that mean? Well, in this context, uh, we have the fact that in verse 1, it states that we have been justified by faith. By faith in the offering that Christ made on the cross in his shed blood to pay for our sin. We have forgiveness. We have his cleansing. Uh, he has sent his Holy Spirit into our hearts to give us a new nature, to make us brand new. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things of new have come. So we have been justified by faith. Oh, that's so important. And then we have peace with God. That's the number one thing that every human being on this planet needs to have because God's word states, states that the wrath of God is on every human being because of their ungodliness, where they just live a life like there is no God, and their unrighteousness. They just do all the sins that they love doing. And so his wrath is upon them. But when we trust Christ as our Savior, then we have peace with God. Then we're on good terms with him. His wrath isn't on us anymore. So, oh, that's so essential for every human being. And it's all through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one that God put forth. If we look back at uh, Romans chapter 3. In verse 23, or 22, it states that the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned. 
and we fall short of the glory of God. But we are justified by his grace. Remember that grace, we talked about that last week, is something that we don't deserve and something that you cannot earn. It is a gift that God offers to us, and we but receive it. Grace means we cannot do anything to deserve it or earn it. It is through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So how important is Christ Jesus in forgiving our sin and giving us peace with God of our justification? It is because of this. God put him forward. He's the one that God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. Because of the sin of human beings, it has to be paid for. There has to be an atonement. And Jesus Christ is the one that God put forth to do that atonement, to pay for that sin, so God himself could be propitiated. That way we're we're not just forgiven and given new life and eternal life in Christ without somebody paying for our sin, and it was Jesus Christ. That's why no other religion in the world will work with God. No other religion can a person be saved and have peace with God and be justified. If they reject Jesus Christ as the Savior, as the eternal God who became a human being, God in the flesh, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, lived a perfect life so when he offered his life as a sacrifice for our sin, it was like a lamb without spot and without wrinkle. God put him forward. That's why it's all through Jesus Christ. (laughs) Everything is through him that we have from God. And then in verse 2, through him we have also obtained access by faith. We have access to God And it's all by faith, believing in what God said is true. Believing that and trusting in and relying on Christ as our Savior. And this access gives us access into his grace. His grace is something that we stand in. It's not just something that saves us. It's something that we live our life by. Paul says, "I, I was such a sinner beforehand. I I was murdering people. I was persecuting Jesus Christ, persecuting those who followed him. But Christ saved me. And he said he actually did more than just save me. He made me an apostle, a chosen one of God, to bear the name of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles of the world. And it was all written in the word of God. So his testimony goes on and on, and it will be forever. And he said, I am what I am, this apostle and this writer of scripture, the one that was taken up to the third heaven, the one that God revealed all these things to me. I am what I am all because of the grace of God. That's the only reason why. I don't deserve to be given this authority as an apostle and as a scripture writer. I don't deserve this but it's only because God by his grace has given to me what I do not deserve and what I could never earn. Paul said, all of the the aspects that are good about my life of being a Pharisee and a follower of God, he said, I count all that but rubbish. So it is through him, through faith in Jesus Christ that we stand. And now we come to the fact that we're to rejoice or boast or exalt in the hope of the glory of God. And we're going to explore this word hope and the glory of God and rejoice and boast all for God. It's all him that has done everything. He's the one that we focus all of our attention on. So as we look at this passage today, we're going to answer this question, how does being justified by faith affect our lives? Well, it affects us, it gives us peace with God. It gives us a clear conscience. But uh, in three different ways in this phrase. First of all, our attitude is that we're ones who rejoice, who exalt. We're joyful. 
And all of our boast, all of our praise is in Jesus. So we can boast and rejoice in any situation in life. And then the second one is that we have assurance of our salvation. We have the hope that God gives to us. Absolute assurance. And then our arrival We're going to arrive at the glory of God. We're going to arrive home someday and be right in the presence of God himself. And then in the eternal city, the new Jerusalem, when God makes the heavens brand new, he burns up the old with fire and he's going to make a new one, then the glory of God will be lighting the whole thing. That's when we finally arrived and we're home and we will spend eternity there in the glory of God. He promises that his glory, we can partake in that. We can partner with him and know this wonderful glory of God. So first of all, we want to look at this attitude that we can rejoice. We stand in this grace and then we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. This word rejoice means, uh, it has the idea of boasting in someone. Remember, we can't boast in our own works in getting saved. Salvation is not uh, according to works. And if it was, somebody would certainly boast. That's what God says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. But it means to take pride in something. We take pride in our God. It means to boast in something. We boast about what Jesus did on the cross. Paul said, I won't boast in anything else except what Jesus did on the cross. It, we glory in him. Uh, we pride ourselves in him. We brag about him. He's God, and he gave his life so that we can live. To boast uh, means also can have this idea of rejoicing. And, it can, and this boasting be, could, could be something that is bad or something that is good. And in the New Testament, quite often it's something bad. In Galatians 6.13 there were people that wanted to boast in getting Gentiles circumcised because they thought you had to be circumcised in order to be saved. So they wanted to boast for themselves. Look what a good job we did in getting these people circumcised. That's bad boasting. They're boasting in man what man has done. and Man was doing the wrong thing. You can't be saved by works. But a good boasting, Paul said, Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of Christ. He is the only one I will boast about. So we can rejoice. We can brag about the God that we serve. Jesus is the creator of heavens and earth. There isn't anything made in this universe anywhere that he isn't the one who made it. And there isn't any way of being saved anywhere in this universe except that he's the one that saves us. And we can boast in the fact that he loves us. He has grace towards us that we don't deserve. We can't earn. He gives it as a free gift to us. He, He promises that when we're saved, the Holy Spirit comes inside of us. He promises to watch over us in every step we take in this life. We are in his thoughts. We are in his mind. And scripture says that his eye is upon us, watching over us. When I go out in this world in a car, (laughs) going somewhere, um, I, I try not to pray that God would protect us. I try to thank God for protecting us. I'm thanking him because he already is protecting me. He's watching over me. He takes care of us everywhere we go. So uh, we're going to come to the next point, and the next point is this, is hope. Hope is such a big thing in the, in the Word of God. Uh, it says at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, now bides, bides these three. Uh, hope is one of those three. Faith is one of those three. Love is one of those three. Hope is such a big thing. And hope in our times means wishful thinking. We hope we can do something. In the time of Paul, he was on trial before a man named Felix. And this man Felix, he had hoped 
that Paul would give him money for a bribe. So he kept calling Paul in all the time to talk to him. And he did that for two years, thinking that one of these days Paul's going to give him some money. That's what he hoped for. There, there was no foundation in a hope like that. Paul wasn't going to bribe him. Uh, today, we, we wake up in the morning and we, we hope that we'll still be alive and be able to go to bed at night. And uh, we hope that we'll have enough money to pay all our bills. We hope that our health will stay good so we can live a good life in this life. We hope things, but we don't know if they're really going to turn out the way that we're hoping. That's the way the world is. But a Christian hope is different. The Christian hope is something that is already set in the mind of God and the way that God says it's going to be. And it will be like that. And we have hope in what he has made for us. Some scripture passages that uh, make this so clear are one in 1 Peter chapter 1. God has done so much for us. He has set things in, in time and space that will not be altered or changed. That 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. And here's what he did for us. He caused us to be born again to a living hope. Our hope is in someone who is living through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus, our Savior, died, paid for our sins, and then rose again to have victory over death. Death has no more victory over him. Death has been defeated. And then he ascended back up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God because he had made purification for sins. He had suffered on the cross and bled for our sins. He died in our place. So our hope of salvation is in a living God. It's a living hope. <coughs> Excuse me. That's what he's given to us. And it's through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And our hope is in an inheritance we're all heirs, and we haven't received what we're going to be receiving. We won't receive our inheritance in Christ until we die. What kind of inheritance are we going to receive? What is the old, uh, one of those Powerball things? Up over a billion dollars now? You see it advertised everywhere? Wow, wouldn't that be something of... Uh, you could win a billion dollars. That would be better than an inheritance. When each of my parents died, they left me a small inheritance, and it helped for a little while, but it didn't last very long. But we have an inheritance in heaven. And part of that inheritance we have <coughs> is we're going to be in the presence of the glory of God, right there with him beholding him, seeing his face, face to face, and, and the brightness of his light. Also part of our inheritance is we're going to receive imperishable bodies, brand new bodies, that will be like Jesus' glorious body when he rose from the dead, that will no longer be constrained by walls. They'll be able to appear in a room with locked doors, we will be able to live life without ever dying, without ever sleeping, without ever getting sick. That's all part of our inheritance in Christ. And, and we have this promise that we're going to live forever. And I feel now like, like we should be living forever. I don't feel like I'll ever die. I feel like uh, we're, we'll get raptured and go up to heaven and be that one generation that never experienced death. That could be. What's happening in Israel right now, it could be closer than we know. But he has given us this amazing inheritance of being with, with God, being around people with nobody evil anymore, w with no more need for a hospital or a police, or a fire, 
Or again, we won't need to be self-protected from anybody. Everybody's going to be nice. It'll be better than Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. So this inheritance that we have, Peter claims that it's not perishable. A couple of weeks ago, we bought this little uh, container of raspberries at a store, and we've been buying them there for a lot of the summer. And the next day, the whole thing was moldy. The whole thing went bad. Oh, it was so perishable. Usually, you know, once we bought the other day, they're still good. They haven't perished yet. We have a, a secure hope in heaven an inheritance in heaven, and it's not perishable. It'll never go bad. And it is undefiled. It can never be corrupted. Just as God said it would be, it will be for us. And it doesn't fade over time. Everything that gets left out in the sun fades. Cars fade. The color of cars, the color of everything in the sun fades. There's no fading with our inheritance it's as vibrant and strong as it ever was when we first got it. And where has God put it? He says, I'm keeping it in heaven for you. Nobody can go there and take it away from us. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. God's power is protecting our salvation. And it will be revealed in the last time. Everybody will know who the real saved are. I think in churches and in the world, there will be some people in heaven that we never thought would be. And it's not because of their works, it's because of their faith in Christ. And there will be other people that we expected to be in heaven because they acted like Christians and said they were Christians, but they really weren't. But... Our salvation is going to be revealed. When we're in heaven, we'll know everybody that's there. <laughs> and those are the ones that really were trusting in Christ as their Savior. And Paul says in verse six, or Peter says in verse 6, to rejoice. Though now for a little while, you, you know, you have uh, various trials and things coming into our lives that are hard to deal with. But we glory in Christ. We glory in our inheritance. It's a sure deal. It's really going to happen. And then at 1 Peter, if we go down to uh, verse 18, Peter says, uh, knowing that you weren't ransomed from a feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, all, all the Jewish laws and all the things that they had. And, and it's not with perishable things like silver or gold. That isn't how we got saved, by offering God money but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but he was manifest in these last times for the sake of you, for us, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. Our faith is in him, he's our savior. Our hope is in him. He has promised that everything in our salvation is going to be carried out. Our faith and hope are in him. For the unbeliever, they have no hope. They hope for things in this life, but eternally, as says in Ephesians 2.12, they're without hope and without God in this world. What a pitiful, hard way to live. At the whim of every false teaching, every false uh, way of life that comes along, they, they just follow it. They're on the course of this world. No hope for the future. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and said, I want you people to have hope that the ones that have died, will, I will bring them. They will have renewed bodies again. They will have resurrected bodies that I'll make brand new, just like I'll make yours new, uh, the ones that are still here on this earth. He promised them that, and he said, I don't want you to have hope as the rest of the world has no hope. A popular thing when people die is to put on the gravestone, R.I.P., rest in peace. 
Well, if they don't have peace with God, believe me, they're not resting. What, it, what they're doing is enduring the pain of fire, and that pain of fire will be their forever pain for their sins. So the unbelievers have no hope. As believers, we have all the hope in the world that God gives to us, all the hope in heaven. <clears throat> so for the believer, we have Christ in us, the hope of our glory. He is our hope of the glory of God that will be in his presence. In Ephesians 1.18, Paul prays that we will know the hope to which he has called us to. He wants us to make that part of our prayers, and we can pray that for others. It's like there's so much in the Christian life, <clears throat> so many good things that he has given to us. He wants us to know and experience this hope that God has called us to. And then in Romans uh, 15, 13, uh, just a wonderful verse talking about the hope that we have in Christ. Romans 15, 13. And here's Paul's prayer. May the God of hope, that's one of the titles of God. He is the God of hope. May this God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope, overflow with hope, J just more hope than we ever knew was possible. And it's all because of the Holy Spirit giving us that hope, telling us the truth from the scripture of what we have in him. He has done so much for us. And then it, uh, John wrote about uh, hope in the book of first john chapter three the first three verses john wants us to know he says see what kind of love the father has given to us he wants us to look at it he wants us to see it he wants us to think about it examine it what kind of love the father has given to us that we should be called the children of God and so we are we used to be wretches we used to be the enemies of God but now he has put us into his own family children of God and the reason why the world doesn't know us is that it did not know him but we know him beloved we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet appeared what will we be? God says we'll be like Christ. It goes like this. But we know that when he appears, when he appears in the air for his church, we shall be like him because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him, who hopes in him, purifies himself just as he is pure. When we see Christ, we're going to see the sinless God, the God that can't even be in the presence of sin. He despises it. He hates it. He abhors it. He, he sends everybody in the world to hell because of it. But when we see the pure God, the sinless one that is just glowing bright with, with cleanness and purity, the absolute no darkness in him, no sin in him, no taint of sin, no corruption whatsoever, virtually impossible. When we see him, we're going to be like him. We will at that point become truly sinless. The sinless nature will be gone. The sinless nature, the sinful nature is so much here within us. I'm tired of it already. <laughs> I, I wish it would just go away. And, and we do have that, uh, that working within us that we have died to sin, that it, that it has no more dominion over us because Christ died and paid for that sin. And that we have a new nature. We can now serve God with a nature made in his image where we will act like he wants us to. We will act like him and not like our old nature. We can do that now. And, and John says, 
when you have this hope of seeing Christ, the pure sinless one, and then you'll be made pure and sinless, he's saying it purifies us now. Why don't I live like I'm going to be living in heaven without sin? So, usually when you sin, you're doing something that you really like to do that you shouldn't be doing. We have the lust and desire of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life of, of wanting to seem so important to people and boasting about ourselves and wanting everybody to think we're wonderful and great and, and seeing things that we covet and we want all, all the way from other people to things. Th we have more things in this world than any society that has ever existed. They, they didn't have electricity. We've got to buy all this electric stuff. How do we live without them? I don't know. Trying to get my kids to live without going like this. Melody sent me a little caption yesterday, and it was a dinner table, and there was the mom and dad and the two boys. And the dad said, I've told you, I don't want you looking at your phones anymore during dinner. And here was two kids holding an old phone, <laughs> just sitting there looking at, at this old phone, you know, an old dial phone. Wouldn't it be dumb just to sit there for hours at a time looking at your phone? Why do they spend hours and hours looking at their phone? What do you do with a phone? You know, you make phone calls. They hardly ever make phone calls, but the Internet's on that thing. Uh, how do we live our lives without all this stuff? God wants our, our lives just to be focused on him, where he is the most important thing. We're, we're learning everything from his word is the most important thing. We want to be pure and live our lives like we'll be living in heaven. Everybody is uh, in, in heaven. We'll be living in the same house. It's a very big house you know, 1,500 miles big and square and a big cube like that. And a lot of rooms in that house. But we're all going to be getting along. And that's the way God wants us to be here on earth, is all the people in his church unified, all of the same mind and getting along together. We want to have this hope in being with the pure one, Jesus, and being in heaven where we will be pure, he wants us to help make us pure like that right now. And Peter says in 1 Peter 1.13, to set our hope fully on the revelation of Jesus Christ, on the revealing of Jesus Christ, set our hope on that, where him and everything about him is foremost in our minds. That wonderful, very old hymn, a few hundred years old, Be Thou My Vision, where, where the writer of that hymn, you knew that God was with everything to him. He wanted nothing for himself. Everything was for God. John the Baptist said, I must decrease and he must increase. He wanted people to see less of John the Baptist, but more of Jesus. He wanted his, his whole life to be a testimony to God, not to draw attention to ourselves. And now back to Romans 2, or 5, verse 2. We're looking at the last part of that, where we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have obtained access into this faith. We rejoice in hope, of the glory of God. What is the glory of God? That, that word means bright. It means shining. It means brightness. It means splendor. It means radiance. Glowing. You know, some of the from our perspective here from Earth, some of the brightest stars out there are actually planets who have no light of their own. They're just radiating or reflecting the sun's light. Our own moon, God made it out of a material that will reflect the light of the sun back to us. But, but God is 
the one that made the sun. He's the one that put all the stars in space, all within one day of creation. He is light. The Bible says in him there is no darkness at all. That's why I believe that before God created everything, the angels, the universe, the stars, everything, that there was only light because he is light. There's no darkness in him. And someday the time will come again where there will be no more darkness. Everything will be light all the time. And it will not come from an LED light bulb. It will come from God himself. He just, he's light. He radiates light. That, that's the glory. Uh, we could say, what is so glorious about that? When we see him, we'll go, oh, I get it now. He just radiates light. He's glory. He's pure. It's a reflective radiance. It also has this idea uh, of honor, of recognition, of status, or performance. God performs everything good. His status is he's God. He's number one. It's recognition of all of that. Uh, the fame of him, the renown of him, the honor of him, the prestige of him, the glowing glory of him. There is going to come a time in this world, not at the rapture where Jesus is coming in the air and the church is going up, but in, in the time when the Son of Man comes all the way down through the air and lands on the Mount of Olives. And when he comes, he's coming with all his angels and he's coming in the glory of his Father. It says as the lightning is from the east and the west, if you lived in the Midwest, there's, you know, we have lightning here, but it's, it's much more there. There's more lightning throughout the year and more lightning bolts when, the, and when it lightens. And when you're outside, the whole world lights up. In that split second, that bolt is, is flashing. Well, when Christ comes, the whole world is going to light up with his glory. And Satan has gathered all the armies of the world to go fight him? Oh, it's terrible to be deceived. <laughs> Just terrible. They need to know the, the truth of who God is. When the Son of Man comes with all of his glory. Timothy talks about God dwelling in unapproachable light. It's so bright you can't even approach it. When I had my laser surgery to correct my retina tear, uh, my wife was sitting in the corner, and she didn't just, w was not told just to close her eyes because the laser was here. She was told to put her hands over her eyes so she wouldn't see. That was so bright, just closing them wouldn't be covering enough. The light was so bright, you had to have both hands over your eyes to block that light. I couldn't close my eye. I had to look at the light. And as it was working on my eye. And that's what, very difficult to do because with a real bright light of you look at the sun, the first thing you want to do is close your eye and look away from it. Well, that laser, you want to close your eye really bad, but you can't. You've got to leave it open so they can work on it. God dwells in unapproachable light. He's so bright you can't even approach it. He is light, says in John 1, 5. God is light. And there's no darkness at all in him. There was a time when Jesus took uh, Peter, James, and John up to a mountain. And all of a sudden, he started glowing. It says he was transfigured before them. And his face shone bright like the sun. And his clothing became bright as light. Like his clothing was plugged in or something. Even brighter. And, and they were just dazzled by looking at, it was just Jesus who was just a man that, that Isaiah says nobody even would take a second glance at. He was just somebody you wouldn't pay attention to. Now his face is glowing brighter than the sun. The glory of God they saw. Peter even, even wrote about that uh, in First Peter, I think it is. Um, he said, we saw him on the mount. We saw the glory of God. 
And it was just amazing. He has to write about it and tell people. When Paul or Saul was on the way to imprison more Christians and have them put to death, he says, I saw on the way a light from heaven, and it was brighter than the sun, and it blinded him. He couldn't see. And what was that light from heaven? He, he said, who are you? And he said, I'm Jesus, who you're persecuting. That was the glory of God that he saw. When John the Apostle, he saw Jesus transfigured that day, but in the book of Revelation, when he was being told by this voice behind him that you're to write all these things that you're told in a book, and he turns around to look who's talking to him. And he said, his face was like the sun shining in full strength at high noon. You, you can't look at it. You go outside and you, you need dark glasses. That's how Jesus' face is now. If we were to see him now, he's shining bright. In, in the, the Christmas story we have, the Christmas account in Scripture, Luke records it in Luke 2. The shepherds out in the fields. And all of a sudden, the glory of the Lord was shining around them. Huh. Spotlight. There was a, a movie that Steve Martin was in called The Lonely Guy. And it was about life as a single man. And he goes into a restaurant. And they seat him at this little table with a place setting here and his place setting. And immediately, all these waiters come and they just grab up all the other place settings because he's alone, just a lonely guy. And then the whole restaurant is kind of looking at him. And then a spotlight goes on him and just lights him up. And now everybody in the restroom is looking at the lonely guy. He's just lit up. Where the shepherds were, the spotlight was on them, and they were just lit up. Everything was bright around them. And they were filled with great fear when the glory of God shone on them. They were terrified. And then the angels spoke, and then it was better. And then they went to see the Christ child. We're to rejoice. We're to exalt. We're to brag about the hope of the glory of God, the hope that someday we're going to be in his glory, that, that someday when, when we see him in the air, of we're that uh, group of people that is alive here on earth when he comes to take his church. We'll, we'll see him in all of his glory and we'll be like him. We're to rejoice and be exalted about that, exalt in him. The poor believers in this world have no hope. They're without God. The, they're going to see Jesus as their judge at the great white throne. People need to be saved. We need to share the gospel that people can know this Christ that is their Savior. Most people won't want it and don't like it, but it's something we have to keep doing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. We're, we're to be abounding in hope in thinking about our God. Christ in us, the hope of glory, the hope of seeing his glory, the hope of being in his glory. The unsaved man can't be in his glory. He will die. But we will be able to, and we're supposed to let that transform our life right now. Paul wrote to the Philippians, and he tells them that your, your salvation, your, your citizenship, who you are as people, is, is not here on earth anymore. It's in heaven. We're citizens of heaven. Sure, we have a citizenship here. One time when Paul was going to be uh, beaten or imprisoned or something, he said, you realize I'm a Roman citizen. And they went, uh-oh because there was a big penalty for doing something wrong to a Roman citizen like that. 
But our citizenship, according to Philippians uh, 3.20, is in heaven. We're citizens. We're, we're children of God. That's our true home. We're just here for a short time. We're traveling through. And we're awaiting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're awaiting him to come from heaven. And when he comes, he will transform our lowly body. And our bodies are lowly. Our bodies are deteriorating and growing older. And this older body that is breaking down and parts of it don't work so well anymore, he's going to transform it. And what's going to be transformed into? Like his glorious body. Wow. And he's going to do it by what? He's going to do it by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. He can do this. This is no problem for him. He's going to transform our body by his power. And if we're still alive here on earth when the rapture comes, it'll happen in a second, in, in a nanosecond, in the very smallest particle of time that there is, small as an atom of time. In the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed, be transformed to be like his glorious body. In Titus, he talks about uh, waiting for the coming of the Lord. And what's going to happen? In Titus 2.11, it says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. Jesus has brought salvation to all people. He is the grace of God. And, and training us to renounce all ungodliness and worldly passions. the ungodliness that brings the wrath of God. As believers, we're to renounce those things. All of our worldly passions that our sinful nature still wants, we're to renounce them, stop them, put them away, don't do them anymore. And we're to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. We can do this. The world is growing dirtier and filthier by the second but Lot did it. He didn't become homosexual. He, he still lived for God. And it says every day, the stuff that he heard with these men and the things that he saw, it said it just vexed his heart. He hated it. But, but he could live still a godly life in the presence of all that. And think of Noah. Every person in the world was wicked and evil and wanted only violence. Every thought of their mind was evil. They didn't even have a good thought. But he was, him and his family were able to live in that whole culture as godly men and women. And so can we. In this present, e this present age, we can live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives, not ungodly. And what are we doing all this time? We're waiting for the blessed hope Hope that we have is blessed, it's good, it's happy. And what is this hope? It's the appearing of the glory. When Christ comes, he's going to be shining. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The declaration of Christ being God. The great glory of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're waiting for him. He gave himself to redeem us from all lawlessness. And he's purifying for himself a people for his own possession. A people, he wants us to be zealous for good works. And, and these things, Paul is to not tell people about because they might object to it. Or it might make them feel bad or it might hurt them. No. He says to, to Titus, declare these things. Exhort people about these things. Rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you when you're telling these things. Whenever I mention our being caught up together, all the comments that come on our YouTube page, 
saying how, uh, you know, that's not going to happen. That's not true. And you don't know what you're talking about. I know what scripture is talking about, that we're looking for a blessed hope. And if the tribulation is coming our way and the Antichrist, why in the world is that called a blessed hope? That's not a, something I'm hoping for. I'm hoping to be left before he comes. There's millions of Christians right around the world that are looking for him coming because they are undergoing terrible persecution all the way till death. Uh, different groups uh, that are that are there and seeing what happens. They, they write and they talk about it. Persecution, that isn't something that Christians avoid or, or doesn't happen. That is something that a Christian really living for the Lord and righteously, God promised, will happen. But the wrath of God in that seven-year period, we won't be here. We're going to be taken. And that's the blessed hope, and we're to be looking for it. And then the book of Colossians, in chapter 3, we're saved. We've been raised with Christ. We, we died to our old nature, and now we have a new nature, and it's like being raised, like Christ's resurrection. And that affects how we live every day greatly. And, and having hope and, and, and the glory of God. This is the passage that Paul is writing to, to show when we set our mind where Christ is seated above, when we set our mind on his word and his way of thinking, and our new nature uh, is just taking it all in, how it will transform our life here on earth and how we live, and what we like and what we watch and what we do and what we think and how we talk. Colossians uh, 3.1, If you then have been raised with Christ, then seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Remember when he sat down at the right hand of God? He had already made purification for sins. He purified all of our sins. They're all washed clean. We're not held accountable to them anymore. And he wants us to have pure hearts, not following the old nature, but following the new. That's where Christ is. He wants us to remember that and to think about that. He says, set your minds on things above, not on the things on the earth. Because you died to those things. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. And Christ is up there. When Christ who is your life. When he appears. When he is made manifest. When he is made known. When we can see him. Then you also will appear with him in glory. In bright shining of the son of God. That is too bright for human eyes to behold we'll be able to behold him because we'll have new eyes and they won't break anymore and they won't go blind. When Christ who is our life, he is our life. He gives us life and he should be our life. You will also appear with him in glory. And then he says, put to death therefore what is earthly. He's not saying, well, you're Christians and you never do those things. What he's saying is, you have the opportunity to live your old life still. But he says, put that old life to death. Like they might still be living that way. He says, no, put it to death. Therefore, because we're supposed to be looking above where Christ is. Sexual immorality, that's the big one. It's, it's usually on top. Because that's where all our passions and desires and everything. That's where we, it's so easy to get messed up. And this world has, has just that stuff put right out here. It's just a, a phone pushing enter away on the internet. And in our minds, everything that we watch. Put all the sexual morality away, the impurity, all of our passions, our evil desires, coveting things we got to have. Keeping up with the Joneses, so we've got to have it. All of that of wanting things is idolatry because we're going to make them our God. 
on account of these things, hey, the wrath of God is coming on that kind of lifestyle. In these two, you did once walk. You lived that way when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. You used to be angry all the time. Put it away. You used to be wrathful and have malice. You used to slander people and talk about them so everybody wouldn't like them either. You used to have obscene talk coming from your mouth. Dirty jokes. Don't lie to each other seeing that you have put off the old self with all of its practices. You have put on the new self, which is being renewed. It's being renewed. It's making renew in our minds in knowledge after the image of its creator. Christ has created an image in us like him. And this image that's in us of him, we're to be renewed in knowledge. Knowledge is our thinking, what we know, what we act upon. So how we live our life isn't how we lived it before. We're living it differently. We're thinking the way God thinks. He's saying you're, how you need to be living is how you're going to be living in heaven. And I'm up here. I want you to be thinking up here. I don't want you to be involved in the filth of this world. You're beyond that. Let it go. Say goodbye to it. You don't need it. You don't want it. It's wrong. Hmm. We're created after the image of our creator. The glory of God. John writes about it in Revelation. How is it going to be? Are we going to see his glory like forever and ever? Oh, yeah. Huh. How are we going to be dressed? Well, it kind of seems like we're going to have uh, one wardrobe hanging up in the closet. Or maybe we'll just have the same one and it'll never have to be washed. I don't know. But it's, it's like this. In Revelation 19... That's that wonderful song that, that, that I've been singing lately, and I played it a lot yesterday, uh, and we'll play it a lot here. I was singing hallelujah, because that's what we'll be doing. We'll be singing hallelujah to him, to the God that saves us. Hallelujah, for the Lord Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. And it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and clear and pure. Bright and absolutely pure. No taint of another color or any darkness in that fine linen. And the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And then down to verse 13. Uh, Christ is uh, clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called is the word of God and the armies of heaven that's us will be arrayed in fine linen white and pure if he wants us to be arrayed in fine linen wh why do we have dirty lives and dirty clothes now he's saying you don't need to do that anymore and then in, in this heavenly city in chapter 21 in Revelation, verse 22, John writes, the glory of God's going to be there. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it. Don't need those anymore. For the glory of God gives it its light. The glory of God is going to light up this new heavenly city, the new Jerusalem. By its light, the nations will walk. The kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day. And there'll be no night there. The night will be gone. We won't need to sleep, so don't worry about that. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations and nothing unclean will ever enter it nor anyone who does what is detestable or false 
but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The most important place in the world for our name to be written. And then the angel showed me the river, the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God, a river, and of the Lamb. And it goes through the middle of the street of the city, and on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and, the, and his servants will worship him, will be there worshiping him. We are his servants. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and the night will be no more. They will need no light or lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Back to Romans 5, 2. We are to exult in the hope of the glory of God. We are to picture those scenes in heaven and the new heaven and the new earth where we're living in the glory of God and the brightness of his glory that lights up everything. No more sun or moon or darkness or night. We're to rejoice in that. Let our minds go there when things are really rotten in this life. Let us rejoice in the place that God has for us. That should give us pure, clean hearts right here because we're going to have pure, clean hearts then. Let's pray together. And Father in heaven, we thank you for all that you're giving to us all that you have given. It's already a done deal for each of us that trust you as our Savior. We thank you so much, Lord. We praise you. We worship you. We glorify you. Teach us, Lord, to exalt and to boast and, and to brag about how good you are and, and all that you promised to give to us. And we know that our promises that you have given are, are, are steadfast. They're true. They will not fade. They will not corrupt. It's a done deal, reserved in heaven for us. Thank you, Lord, for all you've given to us. We pray that as we look at you, that you will change our hearts and our lives to be more like the image that you have made us to be. So have your way in our hearts, we pray. In the name of Jesus, your Savior, and we pray that your perfect will be done. Amen.